Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Glory to the Day of Heroism. Part 2. Declaration from Peru People's Aid Glory to the Day of Heroism 1. The People's War in Peru On May 17, 1980, the Communist Party of Peru, fulfilling its historic mission, took up arms to carry out the democratic revolution to overthrow the exploitation and oppression of principally Yankee imperialism, of bureaucrat capitalism, and subsisting semi-feudalism in order to conquer power for the proletariat and the people, within the context of and for the world revolution and serving it. Since then, and under the undefeated banners of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and guiding thought, the path of encircling the cities from the countryside has developed, and the Revolutionary War is fought as a single unit, the countryside being the main theater of armed action and the complementary but necessary cities. In short, a people's war. In essence, a peasant war led by the Communist Party, the core of which is to create support bases. The seven years of victorious people's war is explained by the fact that we have a party of a new type, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, guiding thought. Because without the Communist Party, there is no revolution for the proletariat and the people. Also, because our party is led by Chairman Gonzalo, who, in a hard struggle, reconstituted it, prepared it, and has been directing it fairly and correctly in the seven years of our process, and is heading towards the achievement of our end, communism, passing from the democratic revolution to the socialist revolution and to successive cultural revolutions previously. Our People's War has four milestones. Definition, Preparation, Initiation, and Development of the Guerrilla War. Definition. May to June 79. The key ninth plenary session that was guided by the slogan, Define and Decide, approving Start the Armed Struggle, thus ending a long chapter in the history of the party and beginning another. The reconstitution has ended, and the new stage began, that of the armed struggle. Preparation. It is the first national conference, November 79, and the first military school, April 80, where the preparation was seen. In this milestone, the party program, the general political line of the Peruvian Revolution, and the party statutes are sanctioned. Political strategy problems regarding revolutionary violence are resolved. People's War and the construction of the three instruments, Party, Army, and United Front, and the decision to forge the first company is assumed on December 3, 1979. That is why on that date, we commemorate the Day of the People's Guerrilla Army. Initiation On May 17, 1980, in Chuschi, with actions to boycott the elections, the People's War began. It lasted all of 1980. Development of Guerrilla Warfare From 81 to today, it has to be seen we find ourselves in the longest period of the war, the strategic defense. In these four milestones, the military plans should be highlighted. Start plan, plan to open guerrilla zones, plan to deploy, plan to conquer bases, plan of the Great Leap, and currently, plan to develop bases. The years that have passed can be summarized as follows. 1980 is the beginning of the armed struggle of the guerrilla war. 81 and 82 are the development of the guerrilla struggle and the emergence of the People's Committees of the new power of the workers, peasants, and petty bourgeoisie, of a joint dictatorship based on the worker-peasant alliance led by the proletariat through its party. 83 to 84 are struggles around the re-establishment of counter-re-establishment, and, from 85 to today, the continuation of the defense, development, and construction for the maintenance of support bases, and the expansion and intensification of the People's War into the entire area of our mountains, from north to south 
from Ecuador to Bolivia. In this seventh year, with the beginning of the application of the Great Base Development Plan, we have made the greatest shaking of the reactionary state, fracturing its bases with our action in the field as the principal thing, and we have achieved the greatest repercussions both nationally and internationally. The party is demonstrating its status as a heroic combatant. The People's Guerrilla Army is more tempered and develops more and more. And, most importantly, the new state is also developing more and more. The incorporation of the masses into the People's War, mainly of the growing poor peasantry, and only in this way can the seven years of the Marxist-Leninist-Maoist People's War be explained. Victorious guiding thought based on self-support is not subject to any master, superpower, or power, and therefore with self-determination. 2. Prisoners of War Against the development of the People's War, the reactionary state unleashed its counter-revolutionary war, since every war takes place between two camps. This counter-revolutionary war is guided by the strategy of the world counter-revolution led by Yankee imperialism. Thus, Belaunde, following the dictates of his imperialist master, launched the police forces to fight the People's War, which they brand as terrorism and being a common crime. It was up to the police forces to fight, the same ones that used cruel repression, arrests, torture, rapes of the daughters of the people, murders as a method of combat, following its policy of, quote, stealing everything, burning everything, and killing everyone, end quote. Having as a response the just anger of the masses, who, led by the Communist Party of Peru, defeated them humiliatingly. Thus, all the police operations failed. Faced with the defeat of the police forces, and mainly due to the emergence of the new power, the Belaunde government ordered the intervention of the reactionary armed forces, and they were entrusted with the re-establishment of public order, and therefore the crushing of the People's War. Thus, with the entry of the armed forces under the government of Belaunde, and later Alan Garcia, they have unleashed, with the support of the police forces, white terror in the countryside and cities, applying their plans to use masses against masses. But when this plan also failed, they resorted to genocide, and within it, the disappearances in May 1986 reached 8,700 Peruvians, who have been murdered in the most vile and sinister form. Being 4,700 murdered, many of them found in mass graves, and 4,000 disappeared. There are 8,700 children of the poorest and most exploited masses, mainly of the peasantry and of the barrios and slums. In addition to continuing with the persecution, detention, torture, and imprisonment of prisoners of war in sinister concentration camps, having gone as far as the extermination genocide on June 19, 1986. From the beginning of the reaction, when not being able to defeat the revolution on the battlefield, what they have done is to prey on those they had in their hands, the prisoners of war. Thus, since they are detained, they are confined in filthy cells. They are denied all the rights that their law contemplates. They are savagely tortured from psychological torture, such as a mock shooting, to drowning in pools of dirty water, electric shocks in the most extreme sensitive body parts, burns, blows to the head, feet, and the liver, to rape by introducing blunt objects, stick, iron, even FAL light automatic rifle, both men and women, vainly trying to break their revolutionary morality and force them to sign self-incriminating statements. Tortures that are applied in the police units, of them mainly the Delcote, the counter-terrorist directorate in Peru, as well as in the barracks of the armed forces. After transferring them to prisons that are true concentration camps, they systematically seek to annihilate them, because of the subhuman conditions in which they live. They are subjected to a totally deficient diet, even preventing their relatives from bringing them food. For example, it is forbidden to bring food on non-visiting days, Saturday and Sunday. And obstacles are put limiting the visit to direct relatives, and they are subjected to humiliating reviews, and in view of their just protests for this treatment, the visits are suspended. In short, a plan of isolation and annihilation is applied. The prisoners of war, 
being combatants of the People's Guerrilla Army, led by the PCP, even though they are in prison, they maintain this condition and fulfill the three tasks of the new type of army. Fight. They have developed successive struggles to conquer and defend their rights, the most important being those fought on December 23, 1982, in El Fronton, in which the prisoners of war barricaded themselves for five days without electricity, water, or food before a requisition by the Republican guards that attacked them fiercely. The prisoners heroically resisted, expressing their firm decision not to allow one more search, as they were robberies and massacres. This fight culminates successfully by starting the visit of their relatives that had been suspended for 15 days. A leap in this aspect is the joint struggle of the STC of El Fronton, Luriancho, and Callao from July 13th to 16th, 1985, achieving the signing of a 24-point act in which they were recognized as special prisoners as a step towards the recognition of their condition as political prisoners, obtained the freedoms and rights constitutionally and legally established by the pressure of the people's struggle itself. Derived from them is the right to self-administration and to live separately from the rest of the prison population, among other benefits achieved in said act. As soon as the Aprista government came up, this act was denied with the genocide of October 4, 1985 in Luligancho, where they were assassinated with premeditation, service, and fury. 30 prisoners of war and 23 seriously wounded, plus 243 with various injuries. The bodies were not handed over to their relatives, despite the existence of a court order. However, this genocide enhanced the combativeness of the surviving prisoners of war, who developed a successful fight on October 30th with hostage-taking, achieving a new act of ratification at a higher level than the previous one of 24 points, because it was signed by the Vice Minister of Justice and other authorities of the Aparista government. From then on, campaigns were developed to unmask and resist the new genocidal plan underway. Produce The prisoners of war made and do diverse craftwork, creating true works of art, in addition to being a source of income for the satisfaction of their fundamental needs, and not simply an additional burden for the people they serve. Mobilize They do mass work politicizing, mobilizing, and organizing their families, as well as to neutralize common prisoners. And what is fundamental, to develop its own ideological, political, and organizational work at all levels, under the leadership of the Communist Party of Peru. Their life in the STC is exemplary, disciplined, cheerful, organized, fulfilling collective tasks of study, cleaning, and cooking. They also celebrate with exultant joy the historical and important dates of the party, the People's Guerrilla Army, and the People's War. Thus, through struggle, the prisoners of war transformed the black dungeons of reaction into luminous trenches of combat, where the red flags flew with the hammer and sickle, trenches that were destroyed in the monstrous extermination genocide of June 19th. The survivors are currently in the fascist prison of Canto Grande, a concentration camp where, once again, by the action of the party and the unyielding struggle of the prisoners of war, another STC is emerging, where once again they sing, paint slogans, and develop political work and struggle, producing and mobilizing in harsher conditions. 3. The Genocide of June 19th As we have seen, part of the counter-revolutionary war is genocide, and just as it was unleashed in the countryside before the further development of the Revolutionary War, the genocide spread to the city with the government of Alan Garcia Perez expressing himself in Garagay, and on October 4th in Lurigancho. It is within this general framework and the specific one of the genocide plan carried out for years against the prisoners of war that the genocide of June should be focused on and in the perspective of the celebration of the Congress of the so-called Socialist International where Alan Garcia sought to raise as a, quote, third world leader, end quote, also seeking to strengthen its government internationally, and, thus, to strike the people's war in better conditions, and in the part that he considered the weakest, the prisoners of war. Added to this, the Navy's revenge for the annihilation of Ponce Canesa, 
a member of the general staff, and taking as a precedent the systematic provocations against prisoners of war and beatings, death threats, detention, and persecution of their families and defenders, the campaign to transfer to the New Canto Grande concentration camp, the reconnaissance flights over El Fronton, the incursions of the navy, and the approval by parliament of the return of the prisoners to the prisons of their places of origin. They made it clear that the genocide plan was aimed at being applied on a larger scale, by one means or another, with the Aprista government and the reactionary armed forces seeking the most politically favorable moment for their ends. On June 18, 1986, the prisoners of war from El Fronton, Lurigancho, and Callao rose up in rebellion against the new genocide in progress. After having repeatedly announced it before the courts and authorities, they rebelled in defense of the revolution and their lives, demanding 26 very just and rational demands, being answered by the reactionary state, under the political direction of Garcia Perez and his government through its armed forces and police, with a monstrous genocide of extermination that has had worldwide repercussions with the horrified condemnation of the barbaric massacre, collapsing like a house of cards the touted international prestige of Alan Garcia, and generating in the country the most serious crisis of the Aprista government, sharpening the contradictions in the reaction itself, removing the political institutions, particularly the self-proclaimed United Left, and especially Barrantes Ligan, the undercover Aprista who heads it, and deeply shaken the entire Peruvian people, tearing off Opera's mask and showing its true reactionary fascist and corporativist character. On June 18, 1986, at 6 a.m., the prisoners of war take hostages and demand the solution of the 26 demands, which, in short, was respect for the acts of July 16 and October 31, 1985, for which they ask for the formation of a commission made up of authorities, family members, and their lawyers. And, this is made known to the judges of criminal enforcement and prosecutors of the three prisons, seeing these are prevented from fulfilling their functions by the order of the Council of Ministers chaired by Alan Garcia, who ordered the crushing of the rebellion by the armed forces, to whose direction would be held by the police forces. The army was in charge of unleashing the genocide in Lurigancho, and under its command, the Republican Guard, Yapanatik. Having bombarded the industrial pavilion with war grenades, explosives, and bazookas, to later finish off the wounded and shoot the survivors, who, according to Alan Garcia himself, would have been 100, those who were severed, pierced with a bayonet, and chopped. In Callao, the one in charge was the Air Force, and under its command, the Republican Guard. With explosives and shootings, they took control of the prison, murdering two prisoners of war and massacring the survivors then kidnapping them and taking them to the men's prison in Cachiche for a month, and later to Canto Grande. In El Fronton, the sinister revenge of the navy was consummated, having attacked with cannons, explosives, bazookas, FAL, war grenades, by air, sea, and land, not being able to take control until after 20 hours, due to the fierce resistance waged by the prisoners of war, despite being in very inferior conditions to later be cruel to the wounded and corpses, leaving the blue block reduced to nothing, destroying it completely after having kidnapped more than 60 and shot an undetermined number of prisoners of war. Only 35 recognized survivors remained. In total of the three SDC, 250 murdered. Those responsible for this monstrous crime are in the first place Alan Garcia Perez, the leadership of the Aprista party, the Council of Ministers, including Alba Castro, because he was consulted, the Joint Command of the Armed Forces and the Police Forces, mainly the heads of the various arms, especially superiors who ordered, planned, and executed this black genocide. Secondly, the leadership of the United Left, and mainly Barrantes, are jointly responsible. Third, the leaders of the political parties, as well as the hierarchs of the church who were informed of the situation and the measures taken and did nothing. Then, one cannot help but condemn the false rumors, the infamous accusations of the various media and information bodies, among which is the Weekly Amauta. The so-called Peace Commission, the Supreme Court, and the Lima Bar Association are also responsible. What did they do? The sinister work of Elijalde, then Attorney General, who justified the genocide. 
the disastrous role of Luis Alberto Sanchez, the sinister work of Ake Solo, Mantilla, who was actually shooting, the infamous complicity of Willy Brandt, from Carlos Andres Perez. The genocide of June 19th has resulted in a political, military, and moral victory for the revolution, even giving us a day of heroism as an imperishable monument that we will always keep. 4. Fascist Denial of the Constitution and Bourgeois Laws The fascist and corporativist Aparista government, headed by the genocidal Alain Garcia Perez, faithful to its reactionary character, violates and denies the bourgeois demoliberal principles and laws, already reactionary but insufficient, every time it requires it to crush the people, even more so when facing a victorious people's war, since to fight it, the reactionaries have to violate its constitution and laws, entering more and more into fascism, as a continuation of the demo-liberal order for the survival of the bourgeois state itself in the face of the growing attacks of the revolution. In Peru, today, a very important example of this phenomenon, and that should be highlighted not only for the serious perspective that it contains, but, particularly, due to its dangerous and growing extension that threatens the entire people, is the legislation against so-called terrorism that APRA is developing. Quote, anti-terrorist law, end quote, special courts, repentance, peasant patrols subject to the armed forces and police, rewards for betrayal, etc. Apart from the permanent state of suspension of guarantees that support extensive areas of the country, including the capital of the republic, curfew and restrictions of all kinds, etc. Thus, APRA, with these legal devices, dictated or in preparation, together with other similar ones in the various fields of social activity, for example, micro-regions, development corporations, regionalization, among others, is laying the foundation for the development of a fascist legal system in their plans to impose fascism and corporatization of the Peruvian society, and, as they dream, based on, quote, 50 years of the Aprista government, end quote. The genocide of extermination of the prisoners of war of June 19, 1986, has been the maximum expression of all the violations and denials of the rights, norms, and principles, and of the organs of demo-liberal power. None have been left standing. Thus, the so-called independence and autonomy of the judicial power has been devastated by the military commanders and the executive power. The totally submissive parliament has not fulfilled any function, neither legislating nor supervising, showing each time its expiration. The so-called electoral power is at the service of the executive, and the great elector is the armed forces, proof of this in the last municipal elections. On the other hand, the disappearance of corpses of many prisoners of war, clandestine burials, violate the rights of relatives to bury their dead, and the men to be buried. Every day, all the rights won by the people in hard days of struggle are violated. Thus, the right of assembly, of inviolability of the home, of organization, of strike, of free movement, of freedom of expression and opinion, and, in addition to the denial of individual and social rights that every bourgeois demo-liberal order recognizes, the very right to life and personal integrity have become today, under the government of Garcia Perez, even more mere demagoguery that seeks to hide all kinds of abuses and iniquities. In short, the Aparista government, headed by the genocidal Garcia Perez, is the fascist and corporativist denial of the bourgeois demoliberal order in the name of the interests of the imperialists, the big bourgeoisie, and the landlords, which implies the imposition of a fascist legal order whose foundations are being laid. We do not exalt or raise the bourgeois laws, but we must denounce and show how the Aprista government and Garcia Perez, who leads it, violate and destroy the basically demo-liberal order of the reactionary Peruvian state, laying the foundations to corporatize Peruvian society by applying its fascist conception and policy, and within this, develop a fascist legal system. Thus, Garcia Perez and his government are neither bourgeois democrats, as some believe, nor much less revolutionary as they demagogically pretend to present themselves. They're plain and simple fascists, who in a short time, the class struggle, mainly the People's War and the June Genocide, finally took off their mask, showing them who they really are 
and not as some imagine. Our position is to defend the rights of the people and the justice that they exercise. We are for the conquest of power for the proletariat and the people, for the new power and development, for the people's war that sustains it, and for a new legal order that today serves the joint dictatorship under the leadership of the proletariat represented by the PCP, as supported by the Worker-Peasant Alliance, and, in perspective, the dictatorship of the proletariat. 5. The Genocide and the Crisis of the Aprista, Fascist, and Corporativist Government The genocide of extermination of June 19th has caused the Aprista government the most serious crisis to date, taking away the mask of nationalist, democratic, and popular, sharpening the contradictions in the reaction, removing all the institutions to more than one international discredit, and an indelible condemnation. This genocide, adding to the sharpening of the class struggle, and within it the people's war as the main one, has made Apera define its diplomatic situation, colliding with a bureaucratic bourgeoisie, developing fascism and corporativism, combining with the trend of bureaucratic capitalism and the old order in the country, without ceasing to represent the interests of the other faction of the big bourgeoisie, the comprador and the semi-feudal landlords, within the imperialist domain, principally Yankee and the penetration of Russian social imperialism that is making its way. The Aprista, fascist and corporativist government headed by Garcia, the armed forces and the police forces after the genocide, have had to face a more potent people's war, which has dealt them hard blows, reaching higher levels in a forceful and accurate way, generating the greatest shaking of the old and rotten Peruvian state until today. In that interim, they held their municipal elections, a palpable example of what the elections of fascism and corporativism are like. But the government was left in a bad way, because it has been a strongly questioned process. There, the collusion of Barrantes with APRA was also expressed. Later, they launched as a test balloon the re-election of the genocidal Alan Garcia, which demanded a modification of the constitution, finding such rejection that they had to back down, for now at least. The creation of the Ministry of Defense is another problem that has generated contradictions for the government with part of the armed forces, since the problem is their control, and for this, they will require great popular support which they do not have, 180 days in which anything can happen are remaining ahead. One of the devices approved in extraordinary legislatures is the so-called anti-terrorist law, which in essence increases penalties and encourages capitulation, propagandized repentance. But the main thing is that the Aparista government, with the support of the opportunists and revisionists, has accentuated the campaign against terrorism, thus following in the footsteps of its predecessor Belaunde, and, what is fundamental, the baton of Yankee imperialism principally and of Russian social imperialism itself, since, as everyone knows, it was Reagan who raised the black flags of anti-terrorism to oppose and combat the revolutionary struggles throughout the world. Consequently, all the anti-terrorist fanfare is simply part of the counter-revolutionary war that only serves the imperialists and social imperialists and reactionaries, and is aimed directly against the proletariat, the oppressed nations, and the peoples of the world, against the world proletarian revolution. This is what is substantive, the essential, and the rest is simply demagogic litter or isolated anecdotal fact that cannot deny that the revolution is the main trend in the world, and the people's war the main form of struggle to transform the world collapsing the old existing order and establishing new democracies or dictatorship of the proletariat based on the unstoppable march toward socialism and communism. The anti-terrorist campaign of the Aprista government, headed by the genocidal Garcia Perez, marks, then, on fire its fascist and counter-revolutionary core. And his persistent and growing propaganda against the so-called dirty war is but part of his anti-terrorism aiming both, together with other measures taken, to lay the foundations for their plans to develop further the counter-subversive war, whose spearhead is aimed at new genocides, forgetting the recent experience that, in the country itself, has shown how the People's War is capable of facing and overcoming genocide, and becoming stronger and tempered by it, deriving, as the years 83 and 84 prove, the expansion and development of the revolution, 
mainly from the Invincible People's War. Another device sanctioned in the aforementioned legislatures is the one referring to the peasant communities, whose center is to further subdue the poor peasantry especially, trying to make the peasant community the base of the corporativist state holding, in addition, the appointment of its authorities to elections controlled by the National Elections Jury, with all the devious machinations and frauds that such processes imply, and to subject the community more to the clutches of bureaucratic capitalism, imperialist domination, and the exploitation and oppression of the revived gamonalismo. But turning their backs to the problem of land that they foolishly consider non-existent, denying the motto, quote, land for those who work it, end quote, and introducing the question of boundaries, the countryside will become even more an acute weapon of conflict between revolution and counter-revolution, and the bomberal drainage of the land intakes will be of little to no use, like in 74. Today they only seek to bring down the revolutionary explosion of the peasantry, so that they do not take up arms and join the people's war. In this way, those who served Pelasco yesterday now serve García Pérez. But the countryside will necessarily continue to explode, and the People's War will become more potent. Thus, the extraordinary legislatures have given a meager and complicated result, and the crisis of the government continues to worsen, which goes from tumble to tumble and from fire to stake. The economic crisis is getting worse every day. The dollar is inflating, prices are rising, unemployment is growing. This what should have been the year of the investment, is not, and it faces a mass struggle that learns more and more from the People's War. The government has also faced a police strike, in which marches and countermarches were given, leaving the so-called principle of authority on the ground. In conclusion, the genocide of June 19th, far from stopping the People's War, has strengthened it, having generalized and extended throughout the country from border to border and intensified, increasingly fracturing the very foundations of the old state, increasing the new power, and developing bases of support in the concrete historical perspective of taking power throughout the country. 6. Day of Heroism and Development of the People's War The Aparista government and the armed forces speculated that with this genocide, they were going to paralyze the actions of the PCP for two years. They dreamed. Since, the People's War has not only not been paralyzed, but has developed more forcefully. It has gained more sympathy and support nationally and internationally. And most importantly, its real perspective is to conquer power in Peru for the proletariat and the people, and its triumph will undeniably serve the world proletarian revolution, thus helping it to be guided and firmly attached to the ideology of the international proletariat, to Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, to the unfading banners of Marx, Lenin, and Mao Zedong. The Day of Heroism is a milestone in the class struggle and the People's War in Peru. It is an imperishable monument for the proletariat and the peoples of the country and the world. Expression of the medal of the men that Chairman Gonzalo, the PCP, has been forging in the forge of the People's War, causing an astonishing moral defeat to the reaction in addition to the consequent political and military defeats to the armed forces that support the outdated and rotten Peruvian state, and to the aprista, fascist, and corporativist government, led by García Pérez, and leading the fate of the old order of exploitation and oppression that still prevails. Glory to the fallen heroes. Long live the revolution. The blood does not drown the revolution. It waters it. Long live the world proletarian revolution. Glory to Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Glory to the Day of Heroism. June 27, Peru People's Aid. Declaration from the Committee of Family Members of Prisoners of War and the Missing. To the proletariat and the peoples of the world. We are the mothers, fathers, compañeros y compañeras, daughters, sons, sisters, brothers, and friends of the prisoners of war of Peru, of the People's War, that since seven years ago burns victorious in these lands impoverished by growing exploitation and oppression. Where the state, the armed forces, the police forces, the repressive apparatuses, and all their means of oppressive domination want to drown out our voices, silence our protests, subdue our minds, and even take our lives, 
so that we do not defend our loved ones or those who we still have left. That we do not vindicate the memory of our dead and disappeared, or the purity of the ideals for which they gave their blood. And all this in safeguarding the class interests of the native exploiters and their imperialist masters all against the deepest and most fundamental interests of the people sinking in hunger, misery, ignorance, unemployment, and all the plagues that the old and rotten Peruvian society unloads on them. We say, enough already. And we launch our cry of protest and denunciation to express grievances, condemn the genocide, and express our highest hopes. We brought into the world the prisoners of war, and those who have disappeared, until today, numbering in the thousands, we nurtured their body and soul. We took care of their first steps. We shared sorrows and joys, crusts of bread and hardship, pressing needs and present risks, the purest feelings and the clearest ideals to change this world for a better one. Holding on to their strong hands, we learned to walk. Their eyes lit up with our laughter, and their bodies and souls shuddered thinking about our situation. Solid fraternal ties united us, and between us, a real loyal friendship. We grieved for the suffering of the people, and we overflowed with enthusiasm with the advances of the people's war. But the counter-revolution unleashed its blows left and right, and often without rhyme or reason, desperate and full of black fury, leaving gaps between ours. The monstrous torture came, the tireless search to find the prisoners, bringing them food, clothing, and provide them with defense following their trail to the prisons to meet the fallen comrades, who are their new family and protection. Thus the dungeons were populated with combatants, and these without ever lowering their heads, arming themselves with clear and precise ideas, with courage and determined will through hard struggles made from those gloomy prisons and concentration camps, shining trenches of combat, where their words, songs, poems, paintings, and crafts that were true works of art infused us with energy, empowering our spirit with their teachings and vibrant agitation. The Aparista government, headed by Lan Garcia, targeted the prisoners of war, thinking of them the weak side of the People's War. He wanted to establish authority, chastise the combatants, and strike the revolution. These protective intentions were materialized in the genocide of October 4, 85, in the shining trench of combat of Luriancho, they bestially murdered and burned the inert bodies of 30, seriously injuring 34 more. But the reactionary victory did not last very long. On the 31st of the same month, the previously beaten comrades defeated Apra, forcing it to sign the recognition of the condition of special prisoners, a step towards the political prisoner and prisoner of war situation, at a higher governmental level than before Belaunde was taken away. It cost blood to reach this triumph, and their defeat led Garcia and Apra to plot sinisterly, preparing genocidal plans that would sow pain and tears in our people, dreaming of breaking the morale of the imprisoned combatants, and even achieving an apparent victory against the people's war. Thus the butchers began to sharpen their knives, brooding deep, helpless hatred in their petty souls. We agitate, propagandize, march and fight in the streets, on January 15, 1986, the committee suffered its baptism of blood. A dead comrade and 20 injured was the cost of stopping the transfer to Canto Grande, part of the new genocidal plan that for months we have denounced and fought using all the means at our disposal. No one will be able to tell us that we have not stunned with our voices hoarse to exhaustion, showing before the eyes of the whole world in Lima the genocide that we saw closer and more threatening each time. We have knocked on the gates of justice, but they did not open. We have gone from Erod to Pilate, but they would not listen to us. We also knocked on the old doors of the church, but its leaders were deaf in their heart, and the authorities, as always, a bitter hell where the voice of the people never reaches, while the political parties, especially the united left, which united with the aprista wagon through Barrantes that clamored for the anti-terrorist front. Only among the working masses, working class, and poor neighborhood residents did our denunciation find an echo of solidarity and frank support, a fortifying encouragement that revitalized our energy. Only in the masses. Where else could we find it? 
only in the people who are the driving force in world history, as the greatest leader of the international proletariat, Chairman Mao Zedong, wisely taught. On June 18, 1986, the prisoners of war displayed the rebellion flag burning in the luminous trenches of combat in El Fronton, Lurigancho, and Callao. Our closest and loved ones, men and women, on the warpath, took part of ourselves, quote, to the heart of the battle, unquote. Our own blood was preparing to run, and our bodies to be torn. The prisoners of war rose up against the macabre genocide underway to unmask the infamous Aprista plans, denounce them before the world and in defense of the revolution and of their own lives, already sentenced to death in the palatial sewers and in the bloody cellars of sullen barracks and brutal intelligence services. The genocidal machinery was set in motion. Garcia Perez, the Joint Command, the Armed Forces, the Police Forces, the military legal body, and all the gears of state repression and its auxiliaries, but the entire repressive apparatus, and all the gears of state repression and its auxiliaries. But the entire repressive apparatus, with the armed forces as its axis and the political command of the president, crashed against the extraordinary fierce resistance that the combatants opposed with, our blood and body on the warpath, resistance that they never imagined to find, showing them that the militarily organized people, even with their own hands, are capable of facing the most arrogant puppets, no matter how armed to the teeth and drown them in their own horror and black pus they carry as blood. Heroism, courage, bravery were squandered by demonstrating once again what are the men who generate the people's war, what are the sons of the people armed with the all-powerful proletarian ideology, Marxism-Leninism-Maoism-guiding thought, here in our country. If hundreds of our loved ones gave their lives by falling in combat, most were cunningly shot, and others were missing in putrid dungeons of the armed forces and police. We feel just and revolutionary pride for the great historical lesson, for the great example that they have given to our people and to the peoples of the world, as well as for the great moral, political, and military defeat that they have inflicted upon the aprista, fascist, and corporativist government commanded by the genocidal Alan Garcia head of the reactionary Peruvian state and his arrogant and deafened armed forces, experts in defeat and in shedding the blood of the disarmed people. The genocide of the prisoners of war in the three shining trenches of combat will remain forever as an imperishable milestone in the new history that is being written with arms, in the complicated geography of the country by the masses organized in the People's Guerrilla Army under the firm direction of the PCP. After the infamous and disastrous genocide of June that has bathed in blood, from head to toe the genocidal fascist Alan Garcia, the leaders of the state, the highest commanders of the repressive forces, and the heads of the reactionary institutions, came the unfinished struggle to date for the recovery of the corpses of our children, spouses, parents, siblings, or friends, and for the kidnapped survivors who have increased the list of the disappeared. Despite all the procedures and struggles that have taken place, the civil and military authorities flatly refuse to even inform where the remains of our loved ones are, and, contrary to what the Constitution and the laws proclaim, there is no authority capable of ordering the delivery of the remains or accurate information to guarantee who is buried in the niches and graves used in the illegal and hidden burials that the armed forces have carried out. Reaching the height of infamy, they have put false names in the Baquijano del Callao Cemetery. Thus, we have reached the condition of the biblical mother who could not bury her children, because she did not know where they were dead. Today, then, in the vaunted Aprista democracy, we have no right to bury our dead, or where to go to let the tears flow, to calm the troubled heart that is already boiling with anger at so much ignominy and iniquity. But all these vicissitudes are nothing but the intricate and increasingly acute class struggle that shakes the country from one extreme to the other. A struggle that has been developing for more than seven years as an armed conflict between revolution and counter-revolution, in which the people's war intensifies and extends. And, seen in perspective, the day is not far off when the current regime of oppression and exploitation that haunts us and suffocates us, making life more and more difficult for us, children of the people, will break to pieces. The triumph of the People's War that fully and completely establishes the People's Republic of New Democracy throughout the country, the only state in which the people, we, will truly have power, 
and will be able to truly care for and ensure their own class interests, and where at last we have a place to bury and mourn our loved ones, and in which their example will always be remembered and exalted. And today, as they did, let us raise red flags with golden hammers and sickles, committing ourselves to occupy the positions of combat that they left, or fervently support the advance of the People's War for its final triumph and glorious end. And together with our comrades, let us raise our raucous battle cry that terrifies the genocidal Alan Garcia and his henchmen. Glory to the fallen heroes. Long live the revolution. Glory to the day of heroism. Committee of Family Members of Prisoners of War and the Missing. Peru, June 87. Declaration from the Shining Trench of Combat of Canto Grande. Glory to the Day of Heroism. A year ago, on June 19th, Day of Heroism, the prisoners of war of the Shining Trenches of Combat of El Fronton, Lurigancho, and Callao rebelled, raising the fundamental truth of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism guiding thought of Chairman Gonzalo, the rebellion is justified, against the genocidal policy underway, in defense of the revolution and their lives, demanding very just and rational demands. The communists and combatants of the People's Guerrilla Army and the Sons of the Masses fought heroically, sealing a milestone of heroism, valor, and courage, expression of the new man armed with Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, a guiding thought that only the Communist Party and the People's War is capable of generating, and stamped the imperishable day of heroism. Our great epic bearing fruit with its precious blood, the People's War and rising as a monumental waving flag, and inexhaustible war cry that summons us to the inevitable final triumph, communism. With this glorious action, our Communist Party, wisely led by Chairman Gonzalo, obtains a great political, military, and moral victory, becoming the decisive action of the great plan to conquer bases that has plunged the reactionary Parista government and its head, Alan Garcia, into the worst crisis he ever dreamed of, forcing him to define his diplomatic situation and develop his corporativist fascist policy and isolate him politically. Our Communist Party has demonstrated once again that it is a new party of a new militarized type, Marxist Leninist Maoist, guiding thought, capable of resisting genocide and continuing to fight. Proof of this is that the surviving heroes and the new prisoners of war have raised the red flags to the top with hammers and sickles in the fascist prison of Canto Grande turning it into a shining trench of combat. Today, we reaffirm our unwavering commitment to follow the shining example of the people's heroes, developing the people's war, serving the world revolution, and to shape the course set by Chairman Gonzalo to conquer the status of political prisoners and, in perspective, prisoners of war. We ratify, with historical optimism, our decision of heroic resistance in the face of the new genocide underway which we will fight, resist, and defeat, thus serving our Communist Party, the people, and the people's war, and the successful fulfillment of the new great plan to develop bases, guided today by the victorious policy of, quote, culminating brightly by establishing a historical milestone, end quote. Long live Chairman Gonzalo. Glory to the day of heroism. Long live Marxism-Leninism-Maoism guiding thought. Long live the Communist Party develop the people's war, serving the world revolution. Eternal glory to the fallen heroes. Long live the revolution. STC, Canto Grande, June 87.